Tilhust, everyone, thanks for coming today. And our school districts are not coming today, um, but we are recording this and we are going to be turning it into curriculum. So if you could um, move forward, that'd be really helpful. Yeah, as forward as you can. <laughs> so til has this a quinchu item ish not skin some pueho some pascual so welcome everybody and i'm really happy to be here for the last lecture of the native american heritage Month lecture series so just a couple of housekeeping notes uh well, we don't have our school districts so you guys all know where the bathroom is <laughs> but if you could silence your cell phones please that would be really helpful and um also i hope that you guys uh, utilize your phones like me to take notes. I think it's going to be a wonderful lecture today. So I'm really happy to introduce um, Cassie Vargas. So Cassie Vargas just recently obtained her language certification through OSPI. So she's officially certified to teach in the school district. She's been working years on that. So I'm really happy that she's here today to do our opening prayer. Please welcome Cassie. Thank you, Cassie. So I'm really happy. When we were talking, we first met um, a few months or a couple of months ago, we were talking about Native American Heritage Month and talking about how we could celebrate it and how we could put a comprehensive kind of lecture series together to highlight the rich history that we have within the tribe. And so we started with Skolowskin, um talking about a historical figure and how he fought for his people and um, stood up for what he believed in for his people and what that cost him in his own personal life and also within the leadership. And then we um, transitioned to something current. We, um, Rick Dizatel came and gave a lecture on kind of his work with the Sinaiks and his experience with the hunting case. And then we had um, two phenomenal speakers last week as well. We had two students um, at Lake Roosevelt High School that came in and talked about their experience and leadership and how they're it was really inspiring to kind of see that leadership going on at that level, and it made me really happy um, for the future of our reservation and the Caldwell tribe. But this, uh, honestly, is the speaker that I've been waiting for. I'm really happy, and he, I know Mel is really super humble about it. Um, but I got my master's, a business administration degree, at the University of New Mexico in strategic planning, policy, and development. And I went on to teach tribal governance and business management at Northwest Indian College. And my good friend, Laurel Ballou, like the first day there as a faculty member, she's like, do you know Melton Askett? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> he's from my home. And so we started um, in this uh, rebuilding Native Nations curriculum. And it's this curriculum that really initiated out of Harvard University. And it was a collection of studies throughout Indian country and all these like prestigious native leaders and so we were going through that curriculum and one of the first tribal leaders that popped up was Melton Askett and that is on a national almost international level so I'm really happy and pleased that we're able to um, showcase kind of the rich history and um, of our tribe and how he worked uh, throughout his career on tribal leadership and developing our uh, Colville Confederated tribe so he was a former Colville Business Council member for the Colville Confederated Tribes. He served as an elected official various times since 1970 and has served as the Colville Tribes Chairman and other leadership positions during his years serving as an elected official. From 1973 to 1976, Mr. Tenasket served as President of the National Congress of American Indians. Mr. Tenasket led the Colville Tribes fight against termination and as President of NCAI mobilized national support for major tribal legislation, including Indian Health Care Improvement Act and the Indian Child Welfare Act. He was a member of the American Indian Policy Review Commission for two years and has represented United States tribal governments at the World Council of Indigenous Peoples and at the Inter-American Indigenous Conference in Brazil. And one thing I also want to say um, kind of about Mel Tadaskid on a personal level is one of the greatest attributes of his character is that he really has a passion for his people, like you can see in leadership, um, how he really cares about the people. And I've witnessed this um, 
multiple times in just my interactions, whether it be at funerals or gatherings. And I really commend uh, his work ethic and his passion to this day, um, continuing fighting for the rights of our people on the Cabo Confederated. So without further ado, please welcome Mel Tenasket. Well, after all of that, what am I going to say? Um, I, I'm sorry this is for the kids that's going to watch this on, on the tube, but I'm sorry the kids aren't here. Because part of, part of the good things with talking to kids is the give and take. Because I'm sure I'm going to say some things that's, that they're, they're going to have some questions about. And um, so that's always good, and that's always healthy. Because I can remember when I was um, in high school in Grand Coulee, I was a Grand Coulee Tiger, and um, a congressman came to visit us and, and started to talk to us about Congress and, and some of his, his um, experiences on Capitol Hill. And it happened to be at a time when this gunman went into the audience upstairs and was shooting down at, at congressman. Since that time, nobody can, you know, carry a gun or they, they can't bring in a bag or nothing. But he was talking about that, and that's the only thing that stuck in my mind. I didn't even think about the big picture of what Congress does and how important that is and how much that affects our lives. Because I was a terrible student. I, <laughs> I was kind of flunking history, English, uh, public speaking, when there was only 12 of us in the class, and I knew everybody, played sports with them, went to dances with them, but I couldn't get up in front of them and talk. The only thing I was good at was art and PE. I, I was really good at those two things. So I say that to kids because you never know what your life is going to bring you. I would have never thought that one day that I would be even asked to run for Colville Tribal Council. Never entered my mind. I came to work for the BI, out of, out of the Navy, out of the Navy, I, uh, in 62, I went to work for the BIA when the BIA's office was up above Cooley Dam where their main office is. And I worked for them for eight years, and I seen how the BIA at that time was preparing the Colville tribe for termination. We were the next in line to be terminated right after the Klamath tribe. And the whole team that was terminated the Klamath was sent to Colville the superintendent, Elmo Miller, and his department heads. And when I, I, so I got to see what they were doing and how they were doing it. Yeah, for example, they would um, take uh, trust money and would say to you, um, I'm not going to give you all of your per capita or whatever it might be, your land sale or your lease. Uh, I'm going to put it in the IIM account, and I'll, and I'll give you so much a month, but you've got to come in and get it. I worked in IIM. I'm the one that wrote the checks. So I seen how he was doing that. I seen people, elders, that were trying to clear their land so they could put in grass or feed for their animals, and they'd have to get approval from that superintendent. And what he would do is he'd say, okay, and then he'd take their land out of trust without telling them, and then they would lose the land to taxes. I seen it. So when people was coming to me to, to do things, I'd say, you really don't have to do that. You really don't have to do that. And they'd say, what? I said, if, if they're telling you that you're incompetent, take them to court and make them prove it. And he got word on that. Do you know who you're working for? And I said, yes, sir, I do. Who's paying your check? I said, yes, sir, I do. He said, so here's what I hear you're doing, and you have no right, no authority, and you shouldn't be doing that. Do you know what I mean? And I said, yes, sir, I do. So I walked across the hall to my department head, and I said, I quit. And he said, no, you can't. You've got to give us two weeks because you're the only one that knows how to run that new check writing machine. Um, bad words, I said. Call, kids, I, I said bad words that I can't say on here. 
um, I'll give you one hour for somebody to learn how to run this machine, and I'm leaving. And so I did. I went home, and my wife said, what are you doing home? And I said, I quit. No, really, what are you doing home? I said, I quit. I can't stand looking at this no more. I'm seeing it, and I'm just a GS3, GS5, and I can't, there's nothing I can do. Well, what are we going to do? I said, I'm going to move, I want to move to OMAC. Because that's where the leadership of the Termination Council was from. That's where the chairman was from. And uh, what are we going to do over there? I, I don't know. I don't know, but I can't do this. So we moved. And luckily, my parents opened up the first tax-free cigarette store, which is still in operation called the Stogie Shop in East Omak. And so... The, um, Mom bought us a little single-wide trailer house in East Omak, right behind where the Stogie Shop is now. And that's where we moved. And I opened up a small health spa so I could be free. I was going to be my boss, and I could go out and be free. And I went around to the Chamber of Commerce. How come there's no Indians working in your, any of your businesses in Omak? How come there's no Indians working in any of your businesses in the Spielum? I had no answers. I just asked him the question. I knew that we had about 90% uh, or so dropouts in high school. So I'd go to the, the school board, ask them, how come so many of our kids are dropping out of school? Are they that dumb? What's going on? I mean, have you looked at it even? Just wanting them to answer, wanting them to look at what was going on. And then I'd leave. Um, Go, I went to the sheriffs and the county uh, commissioners um, asking how come if we make up 10% of the population in Okanagan County, 90% of the people in your jail are my people. Are we that bad? Um, it, was, it was a situation where nobody around OMAC liked me, right? Nobody liked me. But they had to... They had to look at the question. They had to look at the problems that we were facing, our people were facing. And I didn't have any answers for them. You know, the ones that were working in, for the mill over there were people carrying chainsaws or working green chain. The grunt jobs. There was nobody of our people working in any of the offices or, or you know, in the running paper. They were doing the, the hard labor stuff, the dangerous stuff. And... Uh, so we challenged them. I challenged them. And then Lucy Covington from here, who and I knew was one of the leaders of the termination fight, um, heard what I was doing and asked me if I'd run for council on her anti-termination ticket. And I said, no, I'm not a politician. God, I can't, you know, I get upset stomach and have to go to the toilet when I'm asked to talk. I can ask a question, but I can't talk. And she said, I don't care. If you're willing to vote against termination, would you be on our team? I said, okay, but I'm going to lose. Um, and I'll be danged if we didn't win. Seven to seven. Seven terminators, seven anti-terminators. Lucy and Shirley Palmer said, we're going to give the chairmanship back to Nicholson, Narcisse Nicholson, uh, the terminator side. And I, What? We've traveled all over Idaho, Oregon, and Washington getting, India, or getting Colvilles to vote for us, and then we're going to give the chairmanship to the other side? And she said, Mel, it's seven to seven. We give them the chairmanship. They can only vote in case of a tie. So they got six votes on the floor. We got seven votes on the floor. We win. We just got to make sure we show up when the, when the necessary votes are to be taken. We got to commit to that. And it was like a light came on. Yeah, there's more to politics than, than I thought. You know, there's some real thinking goes on how one vote could make that change. So my first day on the council, um, and we met over here, with somebody tore it all down, uh, my historic building over there. Um, I got to make the very first motion as a new councilman, and that was to remove the superintendent of the BIA immediately. And it passed seven to six. 
he was gone. Then the Terminators knew they'd been had. The second motion was made was to oppose termination, and that passed seven to six. And then we adjourned. Um, we we sent had the resolution drafted up, and we sent it back to Washington D.C. as fast as we could get it back to Washington D.C. to show Congress because we had six bills in Congress to terminate us at that time, six, and so we were right at the edge, right at the edge of being terminated, and so that killed our our the termination. So what was next? Okay, it's one thing to kill something. But what do you replace it with? That was our that was our next discussion as our our side. And what you what we needed to do is to find out really what we're facing. What did we inherit? We had a, a, a tribal income, total tribal income of about three million dollars a year in 1970. Three million dollars total. Uh, we had more. Uh, tribal council, then we had tribal employees. Everything was run by the BIA or the IHS, everything. BIA had one social worker, one education specialist. Um, then they had all of the forestry and range and all of that stuff. That was all them. They were like the Godfather. And kids go to a movie and watch a movie Godfather. That's what the BIA was like. They, they ran everything. So we did our survey, uh, and we found out how much of an unemployment we had, over 86%, I think it was, of unemployment. We had over four uh, families living per dwelling. We needed over 450 new homes. Uh, so what is our priorities? And the priority was employment. We needed to do something to get people employed. And then it was our job. Uh, Lucy sent me to Olympia to learn how Washington politics works because they was always our enemy. And, and here's how come they were our enemy. The state of Washington, Department of um, HEW, um, they would get word when a per capita, $150 maybe, was going to be paid out. They would cut our tribal members off of public assistance even before the payment was made, saying that that's an available resource. So every payment, they would, our, our people that, are, that needed public assistance, because what's 150 bucks even in those days, right? Um, they, would, they would get cut off. So um, that's the kind of things that we were facing. So Lucy wanted me to learn Olympia. The first thing that I got to do is to join up with some other tribal, young tribal leaders. One of them was Joe Delacruz from the Quinault Nation, uh, Sam Kagey from, from Lummi um, at that time that was basically them. We was lucky enough to, to make friends with Dan Evans, who was the governor at the time, um, and got him to set up a um, Governor's Indian Policy Advisory Committee, so that if they, if he was going to be doing anything in the state of Washington that might affect Indians or tribes, it could be brought through the the our advisory committee, so we could look at it and give him advice on what position he should take or what changes could be made in it, so that we could stay in peace, or do we fight? The Governor's Indian Advisory Committee, and then we. Uh, Got a couple seats put in uh, uh, DSHS Indian desks, just because of what I told you of the of the babies being adopted out, and we had lost over 300, 350 of our babies that we completely lost, didn't know where they were, and uh, so we got a two seats in there, one to work the hill and and the department, and the other one to work with tribes. Um, and those lasted for quite a while. And we started making inroads to the part, different parts of the state that we were having the major problems with so we could get right back to the um, 
secretary of, of uh, DSHS and make recommendations on what to do to fix them. Uh, I think it was my third or fourth year. I don't know. I get it all mixed up. I'm an old man now, but I was going to resolutions. Oh, so I did that for a year. Come back, make my report to the council. And then on my third, second year on the council, Lucy said, pack up, we're going to D.C. I said, I, I work Olympia. She said, now I'm going to teach you Washington, D.C. Okay, so um, she started taking me to D.C. and I was chairman. I'm, I was made chairman my second year on the council. I was 31 years old. And so when we got over to D.C., I thought, well, God, what am I going to say? I'm not a very good public speaker. Um, and I was terrible in English and, and history, and we're here we're going to be talking and trying to lobby attorneys and, and um, you know, legislators, senators, congressmen. Uh, it's scary. And she said, nope, you're just going to take notes. You don't say nothing. You just take notes. And I want you to pay attention to who I'm talking to. I want you to pay attention to how I'm talking to them. I want you to pay attention to who I mention to them and who I don't mention to another one when we're talking to different people on the same subject. And then at night, she would have me debrief her what I seen with my notes. And if I missed something, if I missed that she was yap, yap, yap to this one before business, uh, and then we got over to the other person, right to business, right? No, no nice talk, just right to business. I needed to see that. I needed to see whose name would be mentioned in this room, but not in this room. Why? And I had to ask why, because maybe they didn't like each other. Maybe there's some history there that she knew about that you needed to work with. So you don't make enemies in whatever office we go to in D.C. I did that for a year. So on my third year, we was going back, and I had my little notebook out, and she said, put it away. What are you doing? I said, well, I, I'm the note keeper. She said, no, you're the chairman. You're the voice now. You, you're the one that gets up and talks. And I said, no, I like being the note keeper. And uh, she said, no, you're the chairman. You've got to learn to do this. Okay, so... I'd get up and I'd, I'd make our presentation to, in a hearing or something, and somebody on, on the hill would ask me a question, but they were all educated people, right? And they'd use big words. And I wouldn't know what they was really asking me. So I'd, my, how I dealt with it is, well, I don't really have an answer for you that, Senator, but I'll let you know tomorrow. And I'd write down, I'd sound out what the words were that I was hearing and then at night, uh, I'd go to my dictionary. I carried a little dictionary to look up what the word meant so that I could get back to them the next day. And that's what I had to do for about a year. So it was a learning experience. And then the next year, uh, I was down in resolutions committee at NCAI, National Congress of American Indians. Uh, she always put me in resolutions because every tribe brought in resolutions, and so I would know what's going on and what the issues are in every tribe that belong to the organization throughout Indian country. I didn't ask why she wanted me to know that, but learn that, but like a good boy, I minded Lucy Covington, you know? And so I, I never really got to see the floor of the, of, of the convention until we'd bring our resolutions up and read them out for approval. And one night I, in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, I was down in resolutions, and Lucy and Shirley and Roger Jim and Joe Dela Cruz and Sam Kagey came, to, came into the resolutions committee and said, Mel, uh, Northwest Caucus met and we voted to run you for president of NCAI. What? I haven't even got to see what happens on the floor. I've all, you always had me down here in a dungeon, and, and you're going to run me for president? I'll lose. And, and the affiliated tribes 
They campaigned hard, 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 and I'd be danged if I didn't win. So I called home that evening, and I said, Nancy, you're not going to believe this. Now what would you do? I said, no. They just elected me president of the National Congress of American Indians. And there was this pause, and she said, well, why did they elect you? <laughs> My wife, right? She knows me. And I said, I don't know. I don't know. And my whole world changed. I thought it changed when I got on the council. I thought it changed when I started to learn about Olympia. I thought it changed when I started to learn about D.C., but it really changed when I got to be president of NCAI. That has an office in Washington, D.C. And everything that goes Indian on the Hill, in the administration, usually goes through NCAI. So I just, uh, it, it opened the doors for me to, to, to be called by um, the Secretary of Interior, Secretary of Labor, Secretary of HUD, Secretary of, of Commerce, I mean, the, the White House, uh, Vice President's office. I mean, it just, I was getting invited to all of these places to talk about where should Indian affairs go? What, what should we do with tribes or this particular region of, of the country? What was going on up in Alaska when they were on their, their uh, Alaska Native Claims fights? Um, where should the tribes be in the domestic council? That's under the Vice President of the United States. So I had to sit with Gerald Ford at the time. He was the Vice, Chair, uh, Vice President of, it, of the United States called me in, can I come in tomorrow? I, yeah. And uh, so I went back and he asked me, where do I think the tribe should be in the domestic council? Well, how many of us really have heard about the domestic council? You know, even in college, you don't hear those kinds of breakdowns in, in, in our government. I said, I don't know, Mr. Vice President, but if you give me a week, let me talk to my people and uh, I'll get you an answer. So we, I went back to my office in D.C., and we started calling around to the different regions of the, of, of the country to ask their leadership what they thought. And that's the answer that I gave back to him. So um, it was, I can't even, it's, it's almost like a dream to me for the kid that couldn't, get up in front of his class and talk in Grand Coulee, for Christ's sakes, to be asked by the Vice President of the United States to come in and give advice on what should happen with the tribes throughout the whole country, including Alaska. The, the Secretary of Labor asked, or no, Agriculture asked me and Joe Delacruz, uh, my buddy Joe Delacruz, to go to Hawaii to meet with the Hawaiian native leadership, which was similar to ours, really, um, who were having troubles with uh, agriculture over there. A lot of their traditional lands were being taken by Dole Pineapple and made into pineapple, well, I don't know, whatever they are. And, and then how that works is they lay out black plastic in between the pineapple rows, and when, when they get done, they just plow it under. And after a while, the, the land is dead, won't grow nothing. It's like looking at a big garbage dump where Dole Pineapple uh, facilities were. And the question was, what should he do about it? What should he do about it? What, what could they do as a policy? And so we traveled around and we met with a lot of different Hawaiians on the different islands and got back to him and said, you got to talk to the Hawaiians. You don't talk to somebody from OMAC, Washington. You, you know, go over there. Go over there. If you can go to some foreign nation, you can go to Hawaii and, and talk to them in person. Go look at their land in person, not just at a picture. A picture is altogether different than going and looking at black plastic flying around in the wind. Dead land. Um, I got asked by the uh, Commissioner of Indian Affairs if I would go to Brazil to represent the federally recognized tribes uh, at an inter-American indigenous conference meeting that meets every seven years. He came here. 
he was, for, for those of you who don't know, the Commissioner of Indian Affairs at that time was over all of Indian, uh, all of BIA, every part of the country. And uh, Lucy knew him. He was a Mohawk Indian, Louis Bruce. And for some reason, he came out to ask if I would go represent the, the Indians or the tribes. I said, God, Brazil? And so I said, I've got to ask my wife. And so <laughs> we, uh, we talked and said, well, if that's what they want, and if they, you have something to offer, go ahead and go do it. Okay, so I went and got all my shots and changed money and flew to Rio from, well, I flew from here to Seattle, from Seattle to D.C., from D.C. to New York, from New York to Rio, from Rio out to Brasilia. I got out there, and in those days, I know you won't believe it, you young people won't believe it, but I had hair. I had braids. I had braids. I had hair down to my waist almost. Tommy can almost remember that far back. Uh, and then the Indians worried it all away. So I, I went with, I didn't wear a suit. I wore a, a sports coat, pressed jeans like Tommy does, boots like Tommy does. Put all my money inside my boots because... <laughs> In case I got rolled, you know, they wouldn't take my boots. Uh, I wore a Billy Jack hat. And those of young ones you don't know, watch the movie Billy Jack. He's a tough guy. And he wore a, like a reservation hat that you see in the pictures. That, but his, his was up, and I flattened mine. And I had a feather hanging off the back, beaded headband. I wore this belt buckle, and I, I went... I went looking like Billy Jack, <laughs> represent American Indians. <laughs> and there was about eight of us from around the country that, that got sent, got to go down there. And um, the leader of our delegation was from the Interior Department. He was a dog. He was just a at every night we'd go to an embassy and, and, and have a feast, right? A different embassy, and we were there for over a week. He'd get drunk. He'd get drunk, and he'd just be a stupid, just stupid. And so I'd be watching him, you know, and, and we were trying to be, we're Indians. We're going to be the good guy and let that white guy be the dog, right? And... Uh, so, but the dog was in a, in a workshop called, uh, it was, had to do with racism and discrimination. And he had to leave, and so, Mel, could you come down and sit, and sit in for me and represent us? And I said, sure. Yoo-hoo. So it was like the UN. So I got my earphones on, and they had interpreters, and uh, somebody from one of the South American countries said, there's no such thing as racism and discrimination in my country, and I'm, I think I'm going to move to um, uh, close this session. And I, I, you could hear all of the Spanish and stuff going around, and interpreters couldn't keep up with it. And then another person from another South American country said something like that, and I raised my hand. And the guy chairing it wouldn't recognize me. So I stood up, and he wouldn't recognize me in my braids and my choker and my buckskin vest and Billy Jack hat and my uh, Tommy Waters boots. And, <laughs> and so finally I hollered, wait a minute, standing there, wait a minute, and silence, man, silence. And I told him, I don't know about your countries. All I know from what I've read, is that you're primarily Catholic. I'm a Catholic. I went to Catholic school. But I don't know what's going on in your country, really. But I know in my country there's racism and discrimination. I know that. I've lived it. And for the sake of my people, in my country, I'm asking you to continue this discussion so that we can deal with some of the issues in my country. And he adjourned. He adjourned. So that night, 
we was at an embassy. And this young guy from the State Department, they all dress alike. They all kind of look like uh, the Secret Service that around the president or somebody, all the same suit, same tie, same shoes, right, same haircut. He came up to me and he said, Mr. Tenasket, Senor, whatever his name was, would like you to come over and talk to him. Okay, who is he? And he pointed at him, and it was the same guy that chaired that meeting. Same guy. I said, no, I'm not going to. He said, you got to. I said, why do I have to? He said, because he's like our Secretary of State for the United States government. That's how high a level he was. And I said, so? He was appointed by his president. I was elected by my people. And so if he wants to be a man, he can come and talk to me. You can't do that. I'm doing it. And about a half hour later, here come this Harrison Lesh, who was the dog. <laughs> he said, hey, Tenasket, this kid from the State Department says he wants me, to, wants me, him, to send you home on the next available flight. He's afraid you're going to cause an international incident. <laughs> I said, are you serious? Are you serious? One little pigeon-toed Indian is going to cause an international incident just because I won't talk to that. I can't say the word again because these are kids. And uh, he said, yeah, that's what he wants. And I said, well, and he says, what do you think? I said, well, it's up to you. It's up to you. You're the head delegate. If you want to kick me out, kick me out. I don't care. I'm... He said, well, if you, if you promise, he said, I don't care what you say. As long as you don't say it representing the United States government, you can represent your tribe or the uh, federally recognized tribes in the United States. You can stay. Is that a deal? And I said, yeah, it's a deal. Yeah, so I got to stay another three more days uh, after almost causing an international incident. Can you imagine somebody from here from East Olmec, from the mountains, from Grand Coulee, Coulee Dam, Elmer City, in that kind of a, in that kind of a world. And I want your kids to, to really listen to that because you never know what your life is going to bring you, right? You never know. Who would have ever dreamed that I'd be called and asked to sit with the President of the United States on Indian issues or the Vice President of the United States? Who would ever dream that I would be going to Olympia to meet with the secretary of DSHS to get him to stop um, putting holes on, on, pay, uh, on welfare payments to our people? And I had to. I mean, you just have to. When you're asked to do something and your people are hurting or are going to be hurt, if you're in an elected position, a friend of mine says, either you lead or get the hell out of the way, right? No matter how you feel, lead or get out of the way. So on, on, the, on the payment issue, I got sent over there and my counsel said, you're not coming back till you win. I said, really? Yeah, I don't want to see you around here again and, until you win on uh, getting payments held. So I packed one extra pair of shorts, one extra pair of socks and an extra shirt, went to Olympia. And I told the secretary, I can't leave unless I win now. So we got to do some serious talking. And I knew him from when I was working with the governor. And I told him, you know, that this is an available resource. This, the BIA, whether I like it or not, can put a hold on, on payments uh, until we get that law changed. Uh, the regulations changed, he can do it. So these aren't necessarily available resources. So uh, you got you to gotta continue to let them be on public assistance. I don't know, I don't know. I said, look, if you don't believe me, let me call this, the Secretary of Interior, and he can tell you. He said, what? So I got out my little black book. I didn't have the secretary's phone number, but I did have 202. And that's the area code for Washington, D.C., right? And then I don't know whose woman I had on the other end of it, but I had <laughs> 202. 
I'm, I'm kidding, granddaughter, I'm kidding. <laughs> so so I, I started to give him the, uh, my phone numbers for 202, and he said, ah, oh, never mind, never mind, okay, we'll do it. Right, so I bluffed him. And I said, thank you, and shook his hand, and, and I left. That's what leadership is to me, right? I mean, you got to go out and fight the fight. One time me and uh, Joe Dela Cruz, I keep mentioning his name like I do Lucy and Shirley, but he was my, my, my buddy and a great leader. We were, him and me and a guy who's still on the council for Jamestown Sklala, Ron Allen, was sitting in a, in a hotel lobby in Olympia after some work on the hill. And we were talking about, you know, it's, it's, um, we're in a strange situation where we're fighting the state on a number of issues, water, zoning, fishing, um, hunting, uh, um, number of issues. And yet we're working together on other issues like human services kinds of things, education kinds of things. Uh, so wouldn't it be nice if we had a, and every time we'd get into a meeting, it was like we'd fight. Who is the most sovereign? I'm the most sovereign. No, I'm the most sovereign. Okay, but I'm better looking. No, I'm better looking, right? And, and it was these silly, silly give and takes of who's the tallest, who's the smartest, who's, who's, who's got the power. And yet, we could work things out, but we wanted to put it on paper. So whether we were there or not, or whether these people are there or not, in the next generation and the next generation. So we started talking about what if we could do this? What if we could do that? What if this would happen? And at the, after about three hours of that, Joe Delacruz said, wouldn't it be great if we had that in writing we, we could give to the governor, and that was Booth Gardner at the time? And I said, yeah, darn. And Ron Allen said he was sitting on a 100-pound laptop-looking thing, one of the originals, heavy. And he had been typing most of the time, and he says, how does this sound? And he read it. And um, that sounded great. What he heard and what he put on paper was so close to what we were trying to get across. So the next morning, we took it to... Uh, Dick Thompson, who was a chief of staff for Booth Gardner, and said, we have this idea. It's a government to government, so we can agree to work together when we can and agree to fight when we have to without jeopardizing the work together and not waste time with all this in-between stuff. And so he read it, and he liked it, and he gave it to Booth Gardner, and Booth Gardner liked it, and he said, i got to give it to the uh, attorney general, and he liked it except they had to change a couple words like from is to are, or are to is, or some, just, they had to make something. You know how attorneys are, right? And, uh, and, and, and so they approved it. And it wound up being the Centennial Accord. If you've heard of the Centennial Accord, that's, what that, that's how that document came about, of just sitting there wondering what if. What could we do to make a difference? That's what, we were, that's what we were doing, a bunch of ladies over on the coast. Ha, 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 you didn't pick on me. <laughs> he said he was going to pick on me. Uh, when a bunch of ladies over on the coast was asking us tri elected tribal leaders to meet with them on child welfare issues. And so a number of us did go. Um, and we listened to their stories. There were heartbreaking stories on child welfare when the state had all of the jurisdiction. And they asked, could we do something to change the laws? We said, well, we can try. We can try, but we're going to need your help to do it. I mean, I'm a politician now. I'm not an attorney. I'm, I'm not an administrator. I'm a politician. My job is to go out and sell. My job is to go out and influence change. Uh, and you experts that are in the field of child welfare, that work it every day, that see what happens, that you know the law that, you're, that is affecting you. 
we need you to be the workers. And then us guys will go out and fight like hell to get the law changed. And then we started talking to other tribes that belong to the National Congress of American Indians that were going through the same thing in their states. And, and so between, and it all started with women, right? To me, a handful of women over on the coast. That's where I seen it going. And uh, out of that came the, the Indian Child Welfare Act. And they're the ones that would, we would, when, when it was starting to be drafted back in D.C., we'd say, wait, we'd bring the draft back and have the ladies look at it. Does this fit? Does this fit? Does this fit? You change a word that you need changed, and let us go back and, and we'll deal with it. And so it was a back and forth thing but it was basically drafted by the women that worked in the business or family members that were affected by it. To me, it was one of the, of all the things that I've been involved with, that's probably the best because it affected lives, right? Future lives. Now it's up to us, up to us and our tribes to enforce it, to recognize the power of that law and use it. So when an outside entity, I'll say a state court or a, a welfare worker out there, calls over here and says, we have an Indian child. We have to react. We have to react. We can't sit and wait. We, and when we first got, we were the first tribe to set up an Indian child welfare program, very first. And Gwen Gua Waters um, was our first uh, director of that, very first in the nation. And so then we, we would had such a, a reputation, the Colvilles did, that we'd get a call from Florida, for Christ's sakes. And we'd send a child welfare worker out to Florida to go check into the case and maybe bring the child back. That's the strength of that law, if you use it. But if you don't use it, you lose it, right? That's, that's like lifting weights. If you don't use it, you lose it. And, and so we'd, we would really, we was always going out promoting, be tough, be tough. If we're going to bust our butt getting you the law, then you got to use it. Don't, don't be backing away. Every time we back away in any tribe, it's affecting the future of that child. Right? That's how serious it is to us. It was to us when we was working on it, and today. Um, and then the other one that, we, that I'm so happy that we really got to do was uh, Indian Self-Determination Act, Public Law 638. That one, well, my personal experience working for the BIA and seeing the BIA being the godfather of all tribes and everything that we do, did, own, have, uh, want to do, Hell with them, you know. Uh, we needed to have Indians in the BIA. We needed to have Indian foresters. We needed to have Indian welfare workers, social workers. We needed to have Indian educators. We needed to have Indians infiltrating that system. And we decided uh, in the National Congress of American Indians that if we could get all the tribes to agree on such a thing, uh, and uh, we might be able to get a law passed that recognizes our own ability to manage ourselves, to re regulate ourselves uh, without the fear of termination. We didn't, everything we did, we thought about, you don't want to set it up so that it's a termination issue. Um, so what, how, we, how we drafted it was to we can assume federal uh, responsibilities but have to run it under the federal requirements. But we run it, right? So if we're going to take over um, BIA uh, forestry, we can, have, we can, we can uh, tweak it a bit when, when we take it over and we employ our own people train our own people, educate our own people in forestry. But you still have federal laws that have to be uh, 
enforced and recognized, then we run them and the BIA pays for it, right? Interior pays for it. And that's the way it is for every federal program that it, Indian Health, we've, you know, we've contracted uh, Indian Health for Inchilium and Keller. Um, we, haven't for, we haven't yet for Nespelum or OMAC, but I, I think and I hope it's on the drawing board. Why? Because they're screwed up. They're screwed up. I don't know how many of your families have been affected by bill collectors because the Indian Health hasn't paid your medical bill or you haven't got your purchase order in time for whatever the medical thing is. They almost killed me two years ago because I wouldn't approve my referral to a heart specialist and I wound up almost dying from heart failure because they didn't approve it. Because now they have a system where employees have to meet as a committee and decide whether to approve a referral or not. These aren't medical. These, some of them are administrative. And I don't have nothing against them as an individual. It's the system. It's the process is wrong. When I ran that clinic, and I ran it for over eight years, uh, so I had OMAC and, and here for about eight years, um, we could approve uh, my staff could approve it right there. My uh, contract health staff could approve a purchase order right then. If it was something really complicated, then we'd have a doctor sign off on it. We paid the bill here. We didn't have to send the bill to, Albu to Portland and then to Albuquerque and some of them to, to Rockville, Maryland. We could do that here. And so the bills were paid on time. Not now. Not now. So we still have some more work to do with Indian Health. Uh, so I hope that when, when, when the Tribal Council looks at the issue of contracting at all, look at Inchilium. See what they've been able to do as a contract uh, clinic where they can go out and they can uh, um, put out proposals. They can get grants. They can uh, build places that Indian Health don't. Right? Indian Health can't go out and get grants. And, and, the, and the hiring system is so slow. I mean, it's so frustrating when I was running a clinic, the, the personnel system, so if we'd find a doctor or a nurse or a dentist, by the time they go through that process of being approved and hired, they found a job somewhere else. A contracted uh, clinic, they can hire. They have a vacancy, they find a doc that's interested and will work there, they can hire. That's where, that's where Indian Health loses. I, I, uh, this Ron Allen, I said, was one of the three that put together the, uh, the Centennial Accord document. He, they developed a clinic over uh, by right off, right not too far from their, their uh, casino. They have 26 docks. 26 docks. How much do we have in OMAC? How many do you have here? How many dentists do you have here? That's the difference in being able to run your own or being under the feds. Now you can do it without being termination. Don't be, I don't even think termination, well I have to think termination because that's always in the back of my mind from what we went through. But there's ways you can do things that protects you and that's what this council needs to know. Not only this council, and the next council, and the next council, and the next council. I mean, I've seen some changes from 1970 when I first got on to now. Hell of a lot of changes. But today we're not fighting the issues that I had to fight, that we had to fight in, in my council days, in the early council days, where you're fighting for jurisdiction. I mean, the Terminationist Council, us older guys know, I'm not, you notice I said guys, I didn't say women, guys know, the uh, state had uh, law and order jurisdiction on the res, right? And, and when I got on, there was one deputy for, from Okanagan County and one deputy from Perry County. That was, that was our coverage. And we had a tribal cop. 
we and the tribe was paying both counties I forget how much to pay for those two deputies well we had no we had no law and order coverage and so when we got control of the council we quit paying they said you can't quit you have a contract we said your contract what are you gonna do about it and uh, we never paid and they so they took it so what we did is we started having to develop some money to to hire cops and eventually when Gene Joseph got on the tribal council and we had a council that was still willing to fight we went to walk to Washington and uh, lobbied for about two years to get a law and order retrocession bill partial retrocession back to the Colville tribe and, uh, and it was because we could work with certain individuals like the president of the Senate that was the last before the governor's signature the bill had gone through the house the bill was on the floor of the Senate and um, it was one of the last bills to be heard before the Senate adjourned for the year one of the last and there was a senator from our area that wanted to make a deal with me he'd vote for it if and it just happened to be some some uh, reporters were standing close enough to hear me saying are you trying to blackmail me senator and then the people around just started laughing and his face turned red and he walked away and he tried to get the bill killed before it got to the vote that's what right at the very last minute and it made the president of the Senate mad and uh, we're gonna vote on this bill and he actually hit we're gonna vote on this bill and it passed and there was our retrocession and I think that if if we hadn't spent the time going over there and meeting people learning who they are knowing what their personalities are that would have never happened and we'd still have state jurisdiction here and so um, I got two minutes did I do enough preaching or I mean in, in my what from 70 to now how many years is that help me hurry 52 years uh, it's it's like uh, been a wild ride it's all it's unbelievable to me it's like I got to, to work with Chief Dan George the actor at a couple uh, Indian Awareness weeks when he was alive and one of the things that he said and he might even have it on a disc or tape or something but I got to work with him on three different occasions and the thing that stuck in my mind he said you know um, people marvel that man has gone to the moon and if the man has gone to the moon we have gone farther himself we have gone farther because we've got I've gone through the days of bows and arrows to the days of the atom bomb and that's a far distance greater than a trip to the moon and when you think about it that's kind of how we are right that's how we are went from one cop one judge one game warden three three million dollars in the bank six bills to terminate us uh, to where we are today that's a distance far greater than going to the moon in in my humble opinion and I got to see it and somebody asked me once what's your what's your dream what's your dream I said my dream I might have lied at the time but I think it's pretty close my dream is to be a, a fat old man sitting on my porch with the confidence that my new young leaders is going to take care of me and my reservation so I got part of it done I got to be a fat old man okay I'm done No questions, right? Did I do good so I no questions?
there's the best leaders that I've ever met, and I've met some good ones, are those that care. Those that care and that are willing to pay a price to do the work that needs to be done. I never got to see my boys grow up. I was on the road. I, I kept a calendar of um, times that I got to be in my yard. It was about three days a month. Otherwise, I was either in Olympia or Denver or Alaska or uh, D.C. or somewhere um, pushing for Indian rights kinds of things. How do we organize? How do we, how, how do we, how do we stick together uh, and not splinter off in our, in our own directions? How do we keep people inspired to fight? How do, you, how do we inspire people to even ask questions? Ask questions. Because I'm sure that most people have a question in their mind, how, well, how did that happen? But they don't ask, right? Or how can we change that? And they don't ask. And everything that we did through the years, of Child Welfare Act 638, uh, Education Act, uh, was you go and ask. And they'll tell you what needs to be done, and then you've got to have the, the willpower, the willingness to put up the, the sacrifice to go do it. And that's the hard part, right? I mean, there's a lot of divorces in, in the world of Indian politics because we're gone all the time. I was lucky I had a good woman and every time she'd hear a rumor that I had another family in Denver or Portland or somewhere, I'd tell her. If I'd have had all the families that I had the reputation to have, I'd have just been a little skinny guy, man. I mean, that's what goes with leadership. And, and, and I've always, every young leader that I've talked to, not only of my tribe, when they wanted to talk to me, is there's two things that'll mess up a, a good leader. Two things, in my opinion. Money and the opposite sex. That gets more leaders, not just here, but in anywhere. White man country, same thing, money. Look at news on TV where the problems are, right? So, um, and just, I didn't know this word at the beginning, but tenacity. Uh, don't give up. Don't give up. There's always somebody out there that has the same concerns that you do. And then there's somebody else that has, and somebody else that has, and pretty soon you've got a, you got a few, right? In, in, in the Northwest, we had like eight of us. They're all dead. I'm it. But they, they work right to the end. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Commitment. You just got to have commitment. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry that that councilman left. <laughs> but there's attorneys here that will relay. Piecemeal termination is you're giving up a piece of your authority or jurisdiction for maybe money. Um, I'll give you an example. In my opinion, you can disagree if you want, but in my opinion, the, the, not this council, but a couple councils before maybe, passed a resolution asking the state of Washington Department of Ecology to uh, quantify our rights in state court. Our water rights, I mean, in state court. To me, that's piecemeal termination. To me, if we're a nation, if we're truly a nation, and I believe we are, I mean, we hope, even though we're an executive order reservation, and I never, did somebody get into the difference between the executive order and treaty? Okay, an executive order reservation is one where the President of the United States writes an executive order, says this is the Colville in, 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 Confederate Tribes Reservation. The Yakimas and the Coasties, they have uh, treaties where 
a treaty is negotiated and Congress passes it, right? Well, knowing that we were only an executive order, and I felt, a number of us felt kind of weak with that, we got Congress to pass a bill recognizing our executive order. So now we have the same legal status, at least, as a treaty tribe. Now, a treaty, the reason that's, that's so important to be recognized like that is because in the Constitution of the United States, the United States can only make a treaty with another sovereign. They can't make a treaty with a corporation or a company or a county or a city, uh, but only with another nation. That's in the Constitution of the United States, supreme law of the land. And so if there's treaties out there between the United States and Indian tribes, that recognizes us as a, as a sovereign, as a sovereign. So going back to the issue, if we're a sovereign, do you ask another sovereign to tell you what your rights are? No. No, you establish your rights. And so the, the question that I asked the council when me and Gene Joseph went up and met with them was, do you think the United States government would go to Canada and ask the Canadian government to adjudicate the water rights for the United States on the Columbia River in Canadian courts? No. They'd have to go through a different process to, of negotiation or treaty to deal with whatever that issue is. But they wouldn't go to another nation and say, tell me how much water I can have in my nation. You think that the Washington state would go to Oregon and say, Oregon, would you, would you quantify our Washington water rights in your Oregon court? No. Sovereigns don't do that. Look around the world, they don't do that. They go to war first. Right? I don't want to go to war, but they can be, they can be worked out. Um, so I, I, I'm not opposed to quantifying. I'm, I'm not. It's where you quantify. Our relationship is with the federal government. They're supposed to be protecting our sovereign rights. They're supposed to be protecting our trust lands, our trust money. Uh, so that's where all of the, the real adjudication should be. Not in a state court, having the state tell this tribe how much water we can have within our boundaries. No. That's piecemeal. I'm sure there's other, other incidences. One of them was, um, I think we beat it though, kind of, the Indian Child Welfare Act before the Indian Child Welfare Act when uh, uh, we weren't terminated yet. But the feds authorized tribes to, and states uh, to assume jurisdictions over us. One of the jurisdictions that they assumed was child welfare. The state did. And that's when we started losing our babies through states court systems. That's piecemeal termination, even though there was not a bill to terminate us at the time. We, we piecemealed a piece of, of our sovereignty, our jurisdiction and authority over our own families and children to the state. That's piecemeal termination. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 Depends on what you, what what is being 638ed. We've the tribes of 638ed a whole lot. We've we've got most of the BIA. We did uh uh education. We did uh social services. Um Range, I think. Yeah. Huh? Law enforcement. Um, 
And if we mess them up, I mean, if we mess them up, there's a legal way for the feds to take it back. But uh, as long as we run them right and we run them the way that they should be run, we're okay. I mean, there's some tribes, I, I want to say in the Southwest, that really mess things up. And they had all of their all of their contracts taken away. The difference there's two different ways though, right? There's self determination, which is 638, and then there's the help me. The ones where we can contract a piece of it, and we leave a piece, uh, and then the feds still continue to pay for what we contracted. And then there's the other, self-governance, I guess it is, where they take everything. Because in the, in the federal system, there'll be, I'll use, um, I'll use, in, um, what, what will I use? A program. The, we, con we contract a certain piece. We'll, we'll say forestry. And there's a, there's, also a piece of forestry in Portland, another piece of forestry in, in, uh, in interior in, in DC. And, and the way that they divide up the pie is each, um, each tribe gets a portion so much on paper, and so does the area office to, to kind of manage the BIA office here. And then that way all the way up. So there's pieces taken out of it. Indian health is a prime example of that. Uh, and those that do self-governance, they take it all. Whoops, there's no, there's no uh, uh, Portland cut taken out of it. There's no headquarters cut taken out of it. They get their whole piece. Um, and if they fail, they fail. But they, they can't, there's no way to go back to I'll, and I'll use the example. If we contracted uh, uh, contract health out of the Indian Health Service or preferred, huh? Yeah, if, if we contracted that whole thing, Yakima's have done that. Uh, you get everything. You get the Colville share of the pot, Portland share of the pot, uh, Albuquerque share of the pot. Rockville, Maryland, share the pot. You get everything. And if you mess up and you overspend, there's no pot to go ask, can you help bail me out? Right? Right now, uh, if, they, if they get into trouble because of, say, uh, a major um, incident where they have to spend a lot of money on really expensive medical um, Expenses like, I don't know, um, airplane wreck. And, and we have a lot of people that are seriously injured and the, and the bills are going to be sky high and they don't have the money. There's a place to, that we can go get a piece from somewhere else. But if we self-governance, we got it all. And so there's pros and cons. Those tribes on the coast that go self-governance they swear by it. Uh, it. It really is going to require some good management. I, that's a little bit different than what you've asked, but uh, I hope I answered you, though, on, on the child welfare stuff. That's a piecemeal. Um, oh, that was you. I get confused. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially, it's a overturn. What are your thoughts about what efforts you are taking, not just in relation to the Indian child welfare, but the doctor's position to return funds? I, I, my personal feelings is it, it scares the hell out of me. Um, because the, the bill was passed by Congress and it's being attacked as, what, non-constitutional? 
but the Constitution allows Congress to, to pass laws and delegate things, it, it scares me as much for the country as it does for Indian country. A number of us old leaders, we used to say that, uh, and we still say that Indian country is like the miner's canary. You guys know what that is, right? Everybody knows what that is? Miner's canary. In the old days, before there were sensors or gases, dangerous gases in mines, they'd have a canary in the mine, and if the canary died, that meant there was bad gas in there, right? So we're the miner's canary on this issue, on, on a lot of issues. With, with the treaty rights that we have, with the sovereignties that we have, with the trust properties that we have, with the uh, um, recognition of prime and paramount rights to the use of water that we have, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the country, who are particularly anti-Indian, are looking at us and saying, that ain't fair. Right? They don't recognize how much we lost, where our country used to be way down there, way over there, way up there, how much gold they took out of here or silver over there, or they built a dam on our land and have been using it for all these years. They don't look at that. And so it ain't fair that we have all of these extra rights. How can we have land that's not taxable? Uh, and so there, there, there will always be a move to take away or... or uh, yeah, take away those special rights because we're in the United States of America and we're American citizens, so how can we have that and we still have this? What makes us so special? And that's where we're the miner's canary. If we can have these rights, and a lot of the non-Indian world don't have those rights, and if things bad can happen to us with all of our protections, supposedly, what can happen to those that don't have those protections? That's why we're the miner's canary. That makes sense? So to answer your question, I don't know. I don't know because I think it's a, it jeopardizes this particular court, not only jeopardizes the American Indian and Indian child welfare, they jeopardize the United States of America, in my opinion. I mean, they're doing some crazy, they've done some crazy things, right? It isn't just Indian. Um, see you, Tommy. Take care, my friend. So I don't really have an answer for you. It just scares the living hell out of me, is really, not only for us, but for, for our country, for the United States. What can we do about it? Outlive them. Outlive them. Get a new president. Get, I mean, get a, eventually get a new court. Right? I mean, we've got to have the right president in there when those vacancies happen. So we've got to look down the road. There's your seven generations. You've got to look down the road. How do we prepare? If there's anything that we have to really know and learn, maybe even learn and do, is to get every damn person that we can register to vote. Every one of them. There is no reason that the House should have been taken over by the Republicans. No reason. When you have so much of the public that is um, supporting gun reform, right? And, and still people are elected in the Republican Party that won't deal with gun reform. That just astounds me. I just, I, I, the, the, Gay rights thing just astounds me. Of all the people in, in abortion, the abortion fight, when, when it's known through all of the different studies that the majority of the people in this country uh, are opposed to the abortion crap that's being thrown around, you know, and probably going to go to the Supreme Court or has, I don't know. That... that we just got to outlast them. I mean, how can they? I just don't. Either we're not turning out enough people to vote, 
or to me that's what it has to be when you when almost as your life and death of your nation and your rights and your right for your own body or your right to live without getting shot in Walmart for Christ's sakes uh, is jeopardized by uh, a party that just will not act on it or, or, or is opposed to what the majority of the people in this country support. So that, that just to me proves that we got to get everybody we can that's the voting age by the hand and say, come on, come on. Otherwise, it's going to continue. People are going to get so disgusted and hell with it. It won't make no difference. Well, yeah, it does. One guy. Did you see on the news? One person won by one vote. One vote in a state election. That's how important. So that's what got Peter McDonald in trouble. Peter McDonald used to be, I'm way past now. Peter McDonald was the president of the Navajo Nation back in my heyday. And what he did is he started busing his people, getting them registered to vote, busing them to the polls to vote. And he overturned some elections down in his four state reservation, just completely upset the apple cart down there. And the feds went after him. There was even a, a mafia hit on him. Um, he upset the whole political apple cart. There's a whole, like a James Bond story that goes along with what happened to Peter McDonald or almost happened to Peter McDonald. Me and Joe met with him once. He came up to tell us to be careful because we were messing with big folks. Um, we were moving money around. There's this story. You wanted me to tell the story. Back in the last story, uh, back in the fishing wars, when Billy Frank and the Nisqually's were getting beat up and boats getting tipped over and people being shot and getting thrown in jail, uh, Billy Frank was the, the name. He was the leader of that movement, kind of. And uh, I went over. I, got, I was new chairman, and I heard that they were going to go out on the river and probably get their boats run over or get beat up. I don't know how many times Billy got thrown in jail. So I went over to meet with Billy and, I, and asked when they're going out again. And he told me, so I asked my counsel, would you be willing to go over there and, and be along the river to, to witness? So in case something happened, we could go to court and witness uh, as a tribe of what happened between the state uh, Department of Fisheries and and the Nisqually. So my whole council went over. And then later on I heard that uh, uh, some big businesses over in the Seattle area were trying to um, mediate. They kind of organized and was trying to mediate between the state and, and, and the fishing people, Billy. One of them was Sea First Bank, where we banked at the time. And so I went to Billy and I said, did you ask these, this group to help you or be involved? And they said, hell no. We're going to, we'll do it. I said, are you sure? He said, yeah. So I went, I said, okay. So I went to see First Bank and I said, I just talked to Billy Frank and they don't want you involved. So get out of it. And I said, I'll give you like a month to get out of it. And I didn't know, I, I was bluffing at the time, but uh, otherwise we're going to move our money. And the month went by, they didn't get out of it. So my council agreed to move $20 million out of Sea First Bank, and we moved it up to Wilbur, I think. And all hell broke loose with the banks over there. I started getting calls from Sea First President, from Rainier Bank President. 
I wouldn't meet with them. I, I, I wouldn't meet with them. And so uh, they eventually did get out of it. But that's, that's part of um, tribes sticking together. That's part of using whatever power that you have to influence what is right and what is just. Uh, and it's amazing when you think about the power that this tribe has with its size. With this size. I mean, hell, I was just one little pigeon-toed Indian going over there and say, we're going to move our money. And, it ha and, and, and we moved it. The last story, again. <laughs> as long as you're willing to sit there. Uh, Cheney Eagles, right? Eastern Washington University. At one time was Cheney Savages. Anybody remember that? Cheney Savages. I was a new chairman, 1971. And some, some of the young Indians got a hold of me and said, can you come out to Cheney and get them to change the name from Savages to something else? And yeah, that sounds like a good deal. That only sounds right. So I went out there and I met with them. And then I got a meeting with the president of, of the school. And I said, uh, you know, we have a problem. The kids have a problem. We have a problem. Our tribes have a problem of being called Cheney Savages, and you have an Indian head on your emblem. So could you change your name or take an Indian, that Indian off of there? I said, oh, no, we've always been the Savages. I said, yeah, that's a problem. And he said, well, we, we can't do it. And I said, well, and he said, I don't really understand since we've been this for so long, why, why, why would there be a problem? I said, try putting a black guy up there. See what happens. You know, put the President of the United States' head up there and see what happens. But it's okay to put an Indian head up there? So I'll give you a month. I always give them a month. So I'll give you a month to change it. Uh, and I don't care what you change it. You put... Put a white man on there. We don't care. Just don't put an Indian up there. We've been called savages enough. I mean, just go to Wounded Knee uh, Monument area. They're still called savages up there. And, and uh, I said, if you don't, if you don't change it, I'll go to the Yakimas, the Spokanes, the Coeur d'Alene's, the Kootenays, the um, Flatheads, uh, every tribe that has an Indian student in your, in your school, and I'll get them to move their kids to a different school. Well, you wouldn't do that. I, yeah, I would. I would. Here, here's my little black book. And that book, I, I should have saved it for, for Kelly to keep because it got me in a lot of trouble, but it made changes too. So I had my list of tribes from my affiliated days, you know, going to affiliated tribes, and, and I was also going to NCI before I got to be president. So I had the names of all of the tribes and their phone, tribal office phone numbers in it. So I showed the president this list of tribes, and I just threw out a couple names, the chairman of the Spokane's, chairman of the Yakima's, his name was Bob Jim at the time, and I said, I'll call him. So this isn't a bluff. I'll give you a month. And they changed it. They wouldn't talk to me for years. Now they're asking me to go out and help them with the Lucy Covington building. You know? <laughs> so you can be a, a bad guy at one hand, but when it all turns out to be the right thing to do, then you're a good guy. Well, that's the last story I'm going to make up. <laughs> but I do have one. No. Well, I hope that helps somebody. Um, if you guys don't mind, we